This is the Neobooks call for Monday, September 2nd, 2024. Somehow we are, have arrived at Labor Day. Oh, cool. And Doug V is here as well. <laughs> Yay, we're just getting rolling. So, um, Doug, we only see this much of you. Uh, you're muted also. Yeah, I'm working on that. Okay, good. good. <laughs> contact, your, above. contact your tech person. See how you can tilt the screen down a little bit. Oh, that was the wrong direction. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Doug, Jax, Jax, Doug. Uh, Jax is in Australia and has been joining us and being super helpful. Um, Doug, where, where's what's your 20, as they say? in C I'm, I'm, today? I'm in southwest Michigan in the United States. Wine country, Michigan wine country. Michigan wine country, which is not an oxymoron. <laughs> what's your thinking? <laughs> Great to meet you, Doug. Good to meet you. That's cool. kind of crazy that there's wine country that far north, isn't it? Like the in, in Ontario, Canada, we've got that wine country down in the Niagara area. Um, it's kind of it works somehow. Somehow, one thing I didn't realize um, I did, until late in life is I always thought like like grapevines, you want to water them nicely, put them in nice soil. It's like no, you want to stress them. They 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 need a little bit of stress so they'll taste better. And I'm like, wait, what? So things that are counterintuitive. I was born in Piku, uh, the Azor Islands, and they grow in rocks. They put a little bit of soil on top of the rock, wow. and they'll find ways to dig themselves deep into the fissures in the rock and stuff like that. It's it's just amazing. So it's mostly volcanic? It's it's all volcanic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah, how I, mean, I call it rock because it's quite literally, it's crushed up volcanic rock. Yeah that they just you know have it as sort of little pebbles and um and then some organic matter gets in there somewhere i i don't understand it life finds a way as they say so famously in the movies um cool do you want to dive in sure i, I didn't do a, a a real presentation here yep um but i i think between doug and i we should be able to um Kind of paint a picture of what we're trying to do and the picture and the um not just the picture but sort of the intention behind it so maybe start with sharing screen of our protocols and uh, just sort of give you a lay of the land of of what we're talking about as far as what a protocol is you guys able to see that yep so demos live we'll see if everything works uh but one way or the other we'll we'll figure it out so the intention is to um, have a platform that people in the community, both just individuals and uh, small businesses, can uh, identify their needs and build protocols that meet their, their needs. And from and we're trying to build this, this kind of clear understanding that you identify a need, you describe your need, you then build a protocol that meets that need, and different protocols, different versions of protocols and so forth will meet that need. And so different people contribute to these protocols, identifying to needs that have been identified. And then those protocols um, get adopted and published publicly. And the intention is that uh, there'll be an API uh, and that API will pull 
uh, we already have an API, it's so just not public yet. Um, we'll, we'll pull whatever protocols you've adopted and place them in your website, place them in your, you know, your social media, wherever you want through an iframe or through an API and actually be able to, to um, show what you have as your protocols. So this means that we're trying to change the mindset around what agreements are, what practices are, what how-tos are. And so the intention here is to, to really start thinking from a place of, okay, I have an agreement, I go to my lawyer, I grab the agreement, and my lawyer gives me an agreement that is between me and the other party. And it's just between us, nobody knows about it. I put it in a, a file folder, I shove it into a file drawer and I pull it out if I have to sue them. Um, that's uh, sort of the way we use agreements today. And so the intention is to say, don't think of an agreement as something that's solid rock, but an ag agreement is a protocol, something that is a an experiment. And so let's use the, this concept of everything is an experiment. And that experiment is something that we all work on. And any side of an agreement or sides of, of uh, how we work together can be um, any one participant can come in and say, hey, I have a new version that I would like to propose. Here's what it looks like and let, allow people to do that. So okay. let me, let me... what's what's the perfect agreement that was in your minds as you started this? What was the use case that was central to you wanting to do this? Uh, for me, it was the operating agreement for a collaborative, for a new type of organization that considers um, collaboration as the central tenant rather than uh, the idea of let's go get an agreement that's hard fixed and everybody signs on it. And we promised you have to behave this way um, rather than this idea that at the time we thought it was X, let's sit down and revisit the terms of, of whatever this collaborative operating agreement might be. So to understand this better, tell me if I'm un understanding this wrong. Please, okay. please ask One away. One kind of agreement would have been, I'm going to write a book by this date of this length. And that would be a known and understood kind of agreement that would normally be called a book contract or whatever else. That would be that would be sort of uh, rendering in our protocols that kind of agreement. But you're, you're actually trying to explore a new kind of organizational structure. And so, and so the agreements that you're looking for for that are going to be of necessity flexier, newer, more squishy, something like that. I mean, you're not choosing as your use case, a known thing that everybody's like, oh yeah, duh, that, and then and then creating it. We want, we want that to proliferate back into the mainstream, uh -huh. right? Um, and so we, we are doing mainstream stuff, for example, oops. Um, here is, a privacy uh, protocol, which we, you would normally know as a privacy agreement that would be on somebody else's website. Um, and But it's written a little bit more. We want to revisit this because it's still not quite as, um, as, as we'd like it to be. But it's a privacy protocol. So taking and thinking about policies as open source components, this is a component that we can click on and we can go and edit it. So we're showing, Doug, you're on mute. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, no, please. I want to, I want to, um, for context purposes, I want to turn the telescope around also so that, um, sort of pulling out, there's a bigger picture within which this is operating, which has to do with um, when people come together to co-create, to collaborate, or when they come to a place to do something new or to take something on or to create a new business or to look for new 
people to play with around a particular theme, et cetera. The focus here is on a new way of orienting to community at large. In its most manifest form, that ends up coming down to people being provided with ways that other people have decided to co-create together. At the protocol level, it's literally, how did other people deal with this, right? And there are choices and there's a living reference base that initially will have some seed crystals, but the idea is that as members join the network that is their community and they need variations and changes, they make them themselves. And those variations get aggregated and collected as a reference base. So it's really, it's not just in the context of deals and transactions whole paradigm. It's, it's a much broader frame actually of um, how one does one's life and that can be business transactions and that can be their relationships and that can be their family and that can be their partnership or marriage. That it's really about any time two or more human beings come together to do anything, it's envisioning a network that supports individuals, supports groups that have already formed and are working together in whatever structure. Um, it's coming at it from a more organic network oriented place. The last piece of the puzzle of that in the envision, envisioning of that in architecture of that, is that in envisioning a network affordance, that that network is fundamentally decentralized. So there's no architectural aggregation of power control authority of anything Anywhere in that network, everything is truly distributed. And that avoids the providers of the means being able to convert or take control or extract or exploit or distort at the expense of the members of that. So this is really about envisioning community meets technology affordance in a completely new way. So, and I'll stop there. No, that's great. Thank you, Doug. That's very good. Um, what I, the way I like to think about it, it's, it's a way to be transparent about everything we do as much as we can. And that transparency in, in part is, is what solves many of the problems we've got. Right, uh, transparency from one to the other. Uh, here's exactly explicitly what I feel, what I want, what I need. Um, and here it is your reciprocal, uh, you know, where you're, where you're at, what your needs are. Uh, but more importantly, that there is a community can see that, that it doesn't exist solely between us that others can see that that's the agreement we have, that that's the uh, a protocol that we've chosen to use with one another. And that we no longer have this kind of like, well, that's secret to us, that that only exists between these two parties and it's sealed in some, in some kind of um, legal barrier uh, that, that keeps everyone else from knowing what's going on. So the intention here is to, to experiment with the idea that these things become public. Say, for example, and this is one that Kim, Kim Wright uh, and I have talked about a number of times, my personal protocol, how do you deal with me? The things I like, the things I don't like, the things, you know, I behave this way. If you lie to me, I don't do really well. If you do things that aren't really fair, I don't do really well with it. And not everybody is has the same things, the same triggers, right? Um, and so th this is the direction we're going, is, is experimenting with all of the above. Does that make any sense to you guys? 
Uh, yes, I and I have a, a ton of questions. And Jax, your mute is on, um, but I want others to go first. Uh, yeah. So it's it's a, it's yeah. I've got a few questions too. Interesting uh, process. Thank you so much for presenting to and coming along on Labor Day holiday for this. <laughs> so it's like it's like um what you're describing there, Jose, is it like a user manual for. for I'm trying to I'm trying to wrap my head around protocols because I. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, because I, yeah, probably that's the first part. I'm trying to wrap my head around that um, as a as an interaction, as an agreement, and moving away from a legal contract is what I think you're saying. So there's there's probably still room for a contract, but this is actually more about a user manual for an in, an interaction or for a situation. Um, yeah, so I see you nodding. You're mm -hmm. either nodding, yeah, yeah, crazy, or you're nodding because I'm on the right path. Um, I'm wondering. Um, with this, how how have you gone? How's it gone with actually um, working it through? Have you got some use cases that have been worked through that is in practice at the moment? And how's that how's that played out in terms of having a living protocol of some sort? Can you give an example? And um, I've got another question. I'll come up back with after this if that's okay. So let me know about how it's used. Yeah. So we've got. I'd say like three or four organizations that are using protocols within this, without this technology, right? Without the the use of uh, our protocols, the website. Um, over the last two, two and a half years, we've been working with, with these organizations that are trying to transform to be collaborative um, and, and not your traditional um, competitive organization. And they've adopted the idea of protocols as a means of um, communicating with each other and saying, well, we don't have a protocol for that, or we, we need a protocol for that. Um, and it's as small as one department, say, for example, in, in um, CORE, CORE is an interpretation organization. So they do interpretation here in, in California for um, worker, um, what, what do you call it? Legal insurance, support. insurance uh, that that has uh, that deals with workers. I've comp, no. Pardon me. Workmen's comp. Workmen's comp, or workers comp. That's workers what. Comp. Workers comp. They no longer say workmen's. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and so, workers comp. People get injured at work. Many of them don't speak English. Um, the doctors have to service them. And so we have an organization that we're part uh, working with as, as one of these um, one of these organizations that are trying to transition into collaborative. And they have different teams. So there's a team that deals with the interpreters. There's a teal team that deals with the um, the clinics, the, the, the health clinics. Uh, and the insurance companies and so forth. And these teams, as in most organizations, like you're not giving me the information you need and you're, this isn't working and this is missing and so on and so forth. So what we've chosen to do is start at both the top and the bottom with, with um, uh, protocols. So the top meaning sort of what's our ethos and let's have some protocols around our ethos. Right, we're going to do this. We're going to help people. We're here to do this, and 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 it's about being of service. Uh, most everyone in the organization is themselves an immigrant, um, and so they know who they're helping. They know what they're dealing with, but very often they think of it as a job rather than a, of being of, in service. So the upper protocols are really about sort of framing this as helping people from our respective communities and and working with them. So that's those protocols. And we have examples of those within, within uh, that organization. But more of the protocols that we've done both there and with other organizations are the bottom up. And in, in CORE, as an example, um, it's things like um, a team calling me up and saying, Okay, I need your help with this protocol because I'm I'm working on this, and what they describe is what would normally be interdepartmental policies, 
that would say, you must submit this to us in this way or we will not work on it kind of kind of policy, right? And it doesn't work. Um, and so what we do is we bring the, um, the whole um, sort of management team, if you will, uh, leadership team and say, let's work on the, this protocol. I have this need. So it's just the need. Do you understand this need? Is this need understood by you, by everybody? Yeah, makes sense. You, without that piece of information, obviously you can't do the thing that you need to do, that you're being asked to do. And, um, and so then they sit down and they work out a protocol. Now they're just doing it on docs for now. Uh, once we have this in a state that is ready, the intention is to move them into this so that they, be, they become public. Okay. Well, I'm sorry for the long answer there, but that's just that's the okay. kind I of... Followed. <laughs> no, that's okay. I did follow. Um, I followed. The, and what I'm wondering about is the um, what you're describing there is actually a conversation between it parties and the protocols are kind of the formality. The, pro the written protocol side of it is the formality. So the conversation between the two uh, entities or three entities is where the magic happens in yes. some way. Um, yes. So the conversation part, and then it's- That's then, the transparency. <laughs> uh -huh. Yep. So yeah, we're all having this conversation at the moment. We've got a protocol at the moment, which is about who speaks and and um, whether we put things in the chat and those sorts of things. And then it formalizes it into a protocol, then goes as a as like a template in a way that others can access. And then with that, if there's another group that then accesses our protocols of conversation on a Zoom chat, and they say, well, we want, we want to have it in this format or it's more better that it works this way, they change it. And it's, a, that's, yeah. So um, my uh, question then is around how are you, um, once things tend to go, so I think this is probably same for um, anything that goes online. Once it goes into a text form online, it can be lost. How would a group like us having this telephone, uh, having this Zoom call go, actually, you know what, we need a bit of a firmer protocol for how we go. Let's go and have a look at the page. Is that how that act, that works? And you go and find the one that says Zoom calls for six people and... Yes. And then draw it down and then go, does this work for us? So that... Um, right. Yeah. And you... you, you... You click on it, you say, let's adopt this one. Everybody else adopts it. So all six of us adopt it. Yeah. Um, and, is there six of us? No, five. Um, and then all five of us adopt it. And we're now, um, we, we agreed to that. And that by adopting it, we agreed to it. Where do you memorialize that? It, in each of our um, accounts, there's a list of things that we've adopted. We can extract it and put it in our agreement page if we choose to, or on our website if we choose to. Um, so we can, let's say the OGM or, or even the Neobooks session meeting, we choose, we have a page on Neobooks, we meet every Monday, here's the thing, blah, 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 blah. And here's our protocols for our meeting, right? And they're an extraction from whatever version. Now, I come in one day and go, you know, that protocol that says X, Y, Z, I'd actually like to change that to something else. And I propose that we move it to, you know, version three. And you guys go, yeah, that sounds good. Or let's have a conversation. And if we go through that process, we've agreed, we update, we improve. So for that, it's a little bit like uh, if you're part of an association and you had some rules and then you would go and actually say, look, we need to change one of these rules. And then the next next committee meeting you have, you go get the rules out and you say, look, 2.1 needs to be changed and you have that. So that, yeah. So that not that a, a, what I'm trying to figure out here, excuse me if I'm in the weeds a little, is just the difference between like um, what, how does this, how does this stand out apart from that process? What's different about that? Um, and just so that I can understand the, the piece of the piece that is, um, yeah. Do, how how does that sit differently to a rule book? 
so it, the intention is not to have this idea of a rule that's imposed by the leadership that mm -hmm. that can only impose that rule and they made the rule and the rule is static and it's done right that's the way rules typically are perceived by us whereas the idea that within any organization any group of people an association or a company or a family that these protocols are intended to serve us they're here for transparency for us. They are owned by us. They don't tell us what to do. They guide us in doing what we do. And if they're not guiding us well, then it is up to us. I have the responsibility as someone who participates in this protocol, whatever this protocol happens to be helping me do, I have the responsibility to be clear that that protocol isn't serving me for whatever reason. The, the or maybe that the definition isn't right. The, the protocol is a, is a reflection of the actual living dynamics and agreements by and between the individuals and the organizations comprising the network. And that um, in that sense, it's not projected or imposed. It's, it's emergent and it's living. And it's subject to change and adaptation as needed, as arising by and between the in system that it's, that it's applied to, that it's been adopted by. Let me put it to, put it that way because that's the variation. Mm -hmm. And I think it also, um, because of the orientation of transparency of this, that pretty much everybody's living out loud in public with these things. So anybody external to an organization or a collaboration or a group or, or a team has the ability to look at what they agree to and came to by and between each other. In that sense, it, it become, it's much more of a community orientation. I would almost sort of correlate it to a kind of tribal orientation that within a community context, and we do, like in most of in most of our con my conversations with Jose, our sort of inspirational focus has been a community oriented. Yeah. And that this is not something that we orient as something that is scaled, but is something that's geared towards support of a community, but then is repl replicable in another mm -hmm. community. And so the networks per se that, that are formed, the memberships in those networks that are created by individuals and organizations and providers and suppliers and resource, you know, and sources of resource, um, that they're very much oriented toward a toward a community local. Yeah. So it's got a different emphasis to it. Thanks for um, answering that. I'm going to pop into the chat um, a link to the, there's a new lot of Indigenous protocols that have just um, come out and I'll pop, pop the links in the chat, um, which might be, uh, they're actually for non-Indigenous people working with Indigenous knowledge, but might be something that's a contribution to the work you're doing. Um, thank you. I'll let someone else ask the questions. Um, well, I would also uh, say that there are engagements that, cannot be expressed in form of rules because there are too many variables or you know, each scenario has unique um, uh, situations. Let, let me just as a practical example, say um, in a, when you work in a corporate environment and you get into a project, you know, there are process structures on how to initiate a project and guide it through stages of development. But you can't put a rule on it because each project is different and unique. Uh, personnel policies fall into that category, right? Uh, each each incident is 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 different in nature, but you want to follow a protocol of exploration and 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 resolution finding. So maybe that's that's uh, a better way to explain it. That's great. Thank you, Klaus. That's very true. 
Um, cool. Uh, I've got a couple questions. Um, and I just put them all in the chat uh, just so I don't forget them. But um, the first one is we, uh, I think Pete raised last time Steve Yagi's grant, rant, and then uh, we talked a little bit about uh, how Bezos uh, imposed an APIs only strategy across Amazon internally, which then absolutely became their Amazon Web Services offer externally because they suddenly realized, holy beans, we could offer any of these services to the outside world, which I think was quite brilliant and a way for a company that was making, like was destroying the retail world, but had all of its profits wrapped up in that business model to suddenly invent a whole different business model for web services. So is is this is your work informed heavily by that, even if it's not trying to replicate it because you're trying to work on a different set of yes. uh, things? I think that, that's mirror, that that mirroring whole... the motivation behind that. Yeah, yeah. The, cool. the space, I think, I think that that what we have learned from both the open source community of open source software, when we consider that 95 to 98% of the code in any one application is an open source line of code, um, that's what we're trying to do here. Because a small business has to basically sort of create all of that code for themselves. Right. And so what if they could start their business with, oh, I like this model. Let me adopt that model of 20, 30, 40, 50 protocols. And right away, the accounting people know what to do. The salespeople know what to do. Everybody knows what to do because we've adopted this one protocol to start. And then we can adapt and adjust. And, and it's a great place to start. Cool. Um, second question, I'm surprised on the screen that you're sharing right now to see a home insurance protocol, a personal goal setting protocol. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. This is getting, <laughs> this is getting extremely more specific than I ever thought it would. And I'm not sure that's a good thing. So the question is sort of multi-layered. How detailed do you want to get this? What is the, what are the boundaries of protocols? How do you bound the space that you want to work in? Shouldn't you be generalizing protocols so that there's not a home insurance protocol? There's actually maybe a, a contracts protocol and then insurance and home insurance would be specific sub variants of that. You don't really, really, really want specific, specific protocols for every action you take during the day. Do you, do you want a toothbrushing protocol? So a protocol, the intention of the protocol much like in, in in open source, the way we're thinking about it. And this is kind of why I wanted to have this conversation. Yeah, right. For sure. It's it's not about our protocols. The, this conversation is about we really need to have these nuggets be really small because a very small nugget gets embedded into my home taking care of protocol. But there's, so, an, but there's an inheritance across these that doesn't work when you fragment that much. Unless you have a very sophisticated inheritance structure, because because once you change something about how you do all insurance, if that don't cascade down to all the little nuggets that deal with all the different forms of insurance and avoids the ones where it wouldn't be applicable, you're kind of screwed. So the intention here, hey, it may not work, but yeah. the intention <laughs> is um, that anything can wrap anything. Okay. So any protocol, you can take the how I work protocol, right? You know, all of the stuff in my work and how I live my personal life and how I take care of my home protocols and wrap them all up and say, this is the how I live my life protocol, right? And, and, and it's like literally everything in my life, right? The intention there is to that every wrapper simply frames, doesn't, Im doesn't impose, but frames what's underneath, right? And so here's, here's my, you know, personal care. By the way, these are two of mine because I, I both suffer from sinus problems and, <laughs> and, and migraine like, problems. And you use neti pots. Um, and so both of, all of these are, things that I've learned in my own personal experience 
years of visiting doctors and years of adopting, you know, new ways of dealing with it and so on and so forth. And there are people who suffer from this stuff. It's not new to have these things available on the web. What's new is this concept of having them as a protocol that I can publish to myself, to my family, to my friends, to the world, and that others can adopt. So you're unafraid of granular detail, that'll sort itself out. Um, and it's good because granularity is good. So then the question is, if we're, now these are not contracts, but to some extent they're functioning as proxy contracts, it feels like. Um, and so, to, to and, and also if you want them to be emergent and change over time, how do you pin them down so that when we agreed to a particular protocol that suddenly evolved and grew wings and had some other thing, how do we do we are we referencing a date and a, and a version of it? And do we We're, then update this protocol later? I'm 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 getting yeah. a little pedantic about it, but yeah, no, that's that's again back why we're having this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a protocol, uh, this is version 1.0. Um, if I fork this protocol, I make another version it actually becomes 2.0, right? It's a totally different version. If I edit this version and I do anything small, like put an extra comma in here and hit save, mm -hmm. it's 1.1, okay? Now you've adopted 1.0. Good. And that 1.1 becomes something that you get notified of that there was an improvement on 1.0. And you can choose to ignore them and you can just stick with 1.0 because you're happy with it. Or at some point you can go, wow, my 1.0 is actually at 1.53. And I should take a look at that because maybe there's a bunch of good stuff there that I, I want to go and adopt. Cool. Um, and Or somewhere in between, anywhere in between. Every single, that comma saved another version. Right. So quite literally, there's a duplicate version of everything but that comma as, as another document. And there, there's there's also sort of another piece to this. And I, I recognize it seems like you start getting that granular and you start creating a monster. And your your volume is really low, Doug. I'm not sure you're picking, I'm sorry. I'm not sure you're using this mic right now. You might be using the desktop mic, but uh, is, is that better? Yes. Um so the point you raised, which is the sort of meta inquiry where we're looking at protocol X and there's a process involving how we change protocol X, which is a different inquiry, actually a different subject and a different protocol. And so what this is really designed to do is to organically grow, not just in terms of hierarchies and nested concepts and, and subthoughts of subthoughts of subthoughts in a hierarchical way, but what this is designed to do is actually recognize and accommodate the multidimensionality of a lot of these center points of focus. That there's 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 a who, what, where, when, how, and why. Mm -hmm. And there is a way of articulating and expressing. And the emergent driver is when the need arises in the moment. There's a question like we want to do how, or we want to do where, why, or when. Mm -hmm. And and uh, if it's the first time, how do we want to go about that? Um, and if we have, we come up with a way and we codify that we go down the road and all of a sudden there's a situation that arises, it's the same domain, uh, but that way ain't working. There's an issue or a problem that's newly arisen. We're, we're adjusting and accommodating and circulating and moving on. And so it creates a really, um, we, we believe we'd like, we, we believe it holds the potential to create a living system, a living network uh, within which all of these variables and negotiations and, and codifications are occurring in real time which, and adjusting yeah. in real time. 
which which comes starts to rub directly against how neo books might be helpful here and what uh, you know what the neo books methods or or things could do for creating living agreements, living documents, living protocols. Um, let me slip to the last two things I put in the notes so we to kind of get them all on the table uh, for a sec. So back in 2021, uh, OGMers, uh, a subset of OGMers, spent oh I don't know 15 calls on something we call the Generative Commons Agreement. And you can see all those calls here in my brain. Uh, and then we've, I put up a baby website, which puts, which I think links into uh, the OGM wiki a bit on the Generative Commons Agreement. And our, our intention with that was, um, if you click on the, the link I put above in the numbered list also. So these are all the calls we had, but uh, up on the chat in the Zoom mm -hmm, chat, you'll mm -hmm, see the generativecommons.org. Mm -hmm. Go mm -hmm. there as well. There's It's a very thin website, but the goal was, um, to be able to do the thing you see at the footer here. This is an open global mind project under CC0 in the spirit of the Generative Commons Agreement. And uh, par partly Michael Grossman uh, triggered this by saying, hey, look, I've got a startup here and I'm showing up at these OGM calls and I have commercial interests and I don't really want to give away the whole, you know, the whole enchilada, but I'm totally up with the spirit of um, doing things together and open sourcing as much as possible, et cetera, et cetera. So we worked for a while and did not complete, as you can see. We've got a Google Doc somewhere that has sort of drafty stuff, but it, it got very messy and, and, and didn't complete. But we were trying to figure out how do you create an agreement where the people who show up acknowledge that there are commercial uh, intentions in, on the table in the room, but also want as much as possible to make everything as open as can be and as available to anybody as possible. And there were a couple other sort of angles to what we were saying, but but we worked on this for a while and I would love for this thing to exist. And it might make a really interesting um, uh, uh, protocol as well, which led me to a number five I'm gonna add to the list, which is um, because these are granular and there could be very many of them, there could be endless protocols. So it feels to me, this is a little bit like a bespoke suit uh, or an off, sorry, it's like an off the rack suit versus a bespoke outfit, right? Where on, bes on a bespoke suit, you have to get measured for everything and it takes a long time and it costs more, et cetera, et cetera. But boy, if you go down to, uh, you know, uh, whatever store and buy a, a, a nice suit from a known label, all the elements of it are kind of known. You, you know the protocol for, am I caught up to fashion? Is going to be check. Is the quality of the fabric going to be good? It's going to be check. Can I return it if I want to? It's going to be check. All those things are kind of known in a bundle of what you might call a protocol suite or a protocol bundle or some other name, mm -hmm. which, you, which you could then say, I want to start a new organization that is a cooperative of this flavor. And there's off the rack, a really nice protocol bundle that you add water and stir to. Exactly. And it, it materializes inside of your wiki and your, 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 your namespace or whatever. Uh, and you can all then say, oh, we work by this bundle. And then you could have specific callouts, dropouts, exceptions by individual or whatever. Like I work by this bundle, but I don't believe in this thing over here. And, and so I don't adhere to it. And it gets a little bit tricky as you move forward, but I can see that happening. And then I'll just, exactly. uh, and I'll just talk through number four for a second. And I'm very interested in what, in the spirit of the generative commons agreement and everything else you've said, what a set, what a suite of neo books protocols would look like. Wow, that was a lot. Um, yeah, yeah, and, you've, and, you've figured and, a bunch but, of stuff. But you're right on target with everything. Everything you yes. just said is exactly what we've been working through. I love that. So, so I've been working with... Um, I love that so much that I'm going to do the laser light show. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been working with lawyers from uh, Brazil, Mexico, um, all, all across Latin America, Europe, and the United States, and Canada. Sweet. Don't forget uh, Canada. And, and basically... The intention here is that many of the collaborative lawyers or the integrative law movement want this kind of protocol to be available to them, this kind of technology to be av available to them, in part because they want different. Um, have you heard of a conscious contract? Is that a, a term that you're familiar with? Uh, yes. Okay. I added a thought of conscious contracts to my brain in 2014. Kim, Kim uh, Wright would have been yeah. probably Kim, likely source. Yeah. 
Kim Wright, uh, Linda Alvarez, who's, who's since passed, um, wrote a book about conscious contracts. And the idea is very much what we're talking about here, is how do we spend the time to tell the truth about our needs hmm. and then build a, a contract, an agreement that is specific to our needs, but with the intention of meeting our needs, not the intention of building an agreement that forces one another to to, to be held to lie. something. <laughs> right. Um, and so, so the the idea that this agreement, this way of doing agreements, it's it's not novel. Um, the uh, well, it is novel in the in the general populace, but it's not novel to us, right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We're just simply saying, okay, these things exist, and we see the need for it in a very practical way. How can we connect these two communities? The integrative law community that is already doing this practice, the three, four hundred lawyers like this around the world that are doing these different practices, um, and these folks that are in small businesses that don't know these practices exist, uh, but there isn't anything to glue the two together. So how can we bring some technology to bear th that builds a platform that links a new way of doing work a new way of doing life with a new way of doing law. Uh, so that's sort of in the in the contract side. But then what we realize is it applies not just in the contract side, it applies to dozens of different practices, practice communities. For example, I, I like to use this one as my example because it's one that, that also got picked up in the uh, law community. Liberating structures. I don't know if you guys are familiar Very with Very familiar. Liberating structures, okay. So yeah, you liberating, an example all the time. Yeah, me too. And so, um, you know, Andy and I have spent many, many hours trying to sort of figure out what does this mean? What does this look like? Uh, what is it a protocol? Right? Because each one of these is essentially another way of doing something. And so a set of, I forget what it is, 34 protocols or something like that that are that people can adopt that people can use and do that so there's many communities of practice that have their own different practices that could benefit from having this as a, as a technology that they could use for their practices so we're melding all of this together and trying to figure out a way to bring about a new consciousness around protocols as a means of collaboration rather than contracts and agreements as a mean of control. Mm -hmm. And and I think well, you know, another dimension of perhaps not V0, but you know, uh, future iterations of this is that the the user interface slash experience of this uh, is also dimensionalized. So that there's there's um, a graphic translation mechanism. So if you've got you know a guy who's starting a lawn care business in a community, who you know he's he knows grass and he knows being outside and he doesn't sit behind a computer, and he's not text oriented, but he can be picture oriented. So recognizing the differences in the capabilities and the cognitive makeup and orientation of users within a community and really expanding the, the orientation of inclusion to all of those and paying attention to that and evolving and developing that so that there are multiple ways in. It's not a one note Charlie user experience either, but what we have now is is literally, you know, scratching the surface start. It's a beginning, <laughs> but it's the tip of a really, really, really massive. So a question, how, how are we going to um, bring this in line with the Neobook project? That was that was really my conversation with with Jerry. I, I suggested that we have this conversation 
Um, and it, this is more about our protocols than I'd like it to be, because my, my intention is not really to promote our protocols to us here, but to look at what there is a, a there's a parallel world happening here. And, and I think this parallel world actually has a lot to learn from each other and that there is a, a, an opportunity to, to think about neo books in this way and to, to much, much the same way, I should say, not the same way. And, and that I think that this nuggetizing, the idea of nuggets, the idea of, of um, versioning, all of these different kinds of things could potentially be very consistent for the way that we do things. And, and maybe there is a, uh, an overarching set of concepts that we're talking about that haven't been articulated, that haven't been defined, that could be, that speaks to collaborative knowledge as a whole, not neobooks, not protocols as a whole, that we could define as a community um, and that that understanding of what that overarching set of, of definitions is could then bring in other groups that are doing other things that fit un under that umbrella so that we build a community of collaborative knowledge that has many different aspects of it, not just neo books and just protocols. Because I think there are dozens of different aspects of that same umbrella. They are, I mean, but you have to start someplace. Absolutely. But yeah. there are other people that are also starting someplace. <laughs> and they don't know about us because we're focused on one thing or another thing. And if the the two communities of our protocols and, and neobooks were to say, hey, there is a collaborative knowledge frame for this. I think there would be dozens of people out there that would say, I'm yeah, working yeah. on that in a different way. Ouch. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I get all this, but uh, I mean, I just posted the the uh, web, the, uh, the definition that Jerry developed some time back uh, on what's a neo book. Um, I mean, why don't we pick up on that? and then put a protocol around it and say, you know, this is how we go about doing this. Um, you know, it's not a rule, it's a protocol. You know, we, we, uh, um, you know, we, are, we are defining a new book around one topic that can be elaborated in form of nuggets uh, that can actually be freestanding uh, storylines within the story. Uh, and they can be, you know, ju juxtaposed, Post across others, so um, so I, I think that would be awesome if we could just expand on what Jerry has started there. So absolutely. So my items three, four, and five in the chat fit what you just said, Klaus. And I would love to take some of our calls here and work on those things. And by three, four, and five, I mean this generative commons agreement that we started but didn't finish. I would love to give it some definition as an R protocol. I and, don't see the agreement at all, by the way. Um, uh, there was and, a Google, any links. There was a Google doc I need to find and, and, and okay. put a link to where we, we had actually started drafting stuff. But you're right, there's no, uh, and I didn't paste anything into the website because it was completely like not publishable. Um, but I would love to complete some sort of generative commons agreement that is broader than the Neobooks project. It's meant to be a generative commons agreement for anybody working on something where they know there's commercial stuff going on, but they would, would like to make it as open as possible. So that, that, that's that's one thing. I would love to have a, a, neo, a set of Neobooks protocols, whatever and however that means, that adhere to the generative commons agreement as one of their protocols, but then include other things about how Neobooks are meant to work and how we do this and how we do that. And I, I think as I'm understanding it, this is a little bit of howto.com done very differently, right? Uh, be, because howto.com will give you five minute videos of how to tie a bow tie. Th this is, hey, how do I collaborate on an emergent nugget of information? Hey, how do I nuggetize information? Then I'm busy trying to write nuggets in markdown files using Obsidian and pushing them to GitHub. 
some of those, uh, I think, I think maybe a large number of those would qualify as art protocol descriptions, but I don't know what it means or takes to be an art protocol description. I don't know the frame of things that you require for their, you know, and, and we can learn that and we can sort of use that as an example. Uh, and but we I can, can improve on them because we can co-evolve it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But, but I can easily see a protocol suite Two, so there's two protocol suites I would be interested in, in working with. One is Generative Commons Agreement. Another one is Neobooks. This is selfish because these are all things that would inform my work and the Neobooks project. I'm happy to work on others as well. But these two like immediately jump out at me um, and then uh, and, and sort of turn those into a sort of a suite. And then I added in the chat the story. And a thing that's missing from the website, I mean, there's maybe maybe many things missing from the Art Protocol website, <laughs> but I'm missing some kind of a hook, a story that says, here's a use case, here's a here's why this thing came about, whatever it might be. But you, you need a, a bit of a story with a human touch, not just text, but you guys interviewing each other uh, for like how this came about or whatnot. I had never heard of integrative law it's absolutely fascinating. Call, you know, call me a fan. I'm on board. I, I need to learn more about it. But I think I think that lawyers trying to rethink how the law even works is brilliant because the law is one of our problems. Yes. And, and you know, the moment you said, you know, we're, we're working with a lot of lawyers and it's like, ah, oh, man, when you're trying to get something productive done and you bring a lot of lawyers in the room, that usually harshes the buzz. Um, but in this case, I think it's the, it could be the opposite, which is really, really cool as well. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I think maybe what we do is over the next little stretch, we, we structure some of our calls around this work. Um, my, I, I, my GPT is obviously biased towards knuckles, toward, towards the neo books because I've been working with it for uh, more than a year. So this is the opinion my GPT has about neo books and knuckles. I love biasing your GPT, that's great. Um, I, I will also add that uh, April and I are going to be gone from the week before Thanksgiving through the first week of December in Australia. So it'll be hard for me. I don't know, Jax, that I'll have your ability to get up at zero hour in the morning to participate here. We could shift the calls to later or I have, someone else could just run them while I'm away. And it, it'll be three weeks that I'm gone. So uh, I'll, I'll put word out across OGM because we're going to need to adapt a couple things there. But that's a, a tiny separate item. But I'm, I'm excited by this because I can see see how this fits. And I'm very interested in how people come to agreement on stuff without being, I'm going to say, pedantic or legalistic or too precise about it. There needs to be a bit of looseness because for a person like me, I value freedom in some whatever, however I'm going to define it, I'm not sure, but I value that a lot. So the moment I enter something that says, oh, you're going to do exactly this and this is how my body starts to quiver and, and shake. Um, but I also like there being a consistency and predictability and to, to our expectations with one another and to how we think we're going to show up. That's an awesome thing. And I really know that if we're going to do something differently in the world, we need to be extra double clear about how it's different, why it's valuable, and how you can join up immediately. Because if we, if I think a piece of what we want to have is a contagion vector, uh, we would like to have other people catch this from us. And uh, the only way they're going to catch this from us is if it's very, very contagious and easy to adopt. And, and so when I pointed to the footer on the gen uh, uh, Generative Commons website, I mean, that's how easy it should be to adopt. You should be able to say, just like CC0, like Creative Commons is a very nice model here. Um, because they've got evolutions of different models. E each model means something a little bit different. And even that is hard for people to understand, hard for me to understand. So I'm like, if most if most people say CC0 is the way to go, I'm good with that. But I don't, I couldn't argue my way out of a paper bag around Creative Commons if I had to. Um, I would just say that this is this is the right way to go, right? And your your what you said, I mean, just about everything you've said today is stuff that we've said that we thought that has been part of this process awesome the uh, uh the uh wiki how or how whatever yep. it's called yep um exactly i mean huh. that is exactly what we're talking about but the thing is it's it's also agreements right like it's it, it's this it's bringing together a whole host of things that would normally be distinguished and like separate and apart and that has nothing to do with to these practices that are 
good practices that we all want to do. So bringing that all together and framing it as an experimental environment, that that isn't about control, that is about helping us do us better. That is really what we're talking about. And it's 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 less about the technology, though obviously it has to work, it has to be good, it has to be all these other things. But it's more about this new mindset of, oh shit, I'm responsible for maintaining this openness, this this collaboration. It's not that that imposed structure is what's going to keep us together, but that I have some both power and obligation to maintain that. There's and even further that, there's also an element of trust in there. I trust that you and I are on the same page with this because we've written it down, we understand it, which, you know, the contract was probably meant to do originally, but puts it in, you know. Yeah, and, and, and I think trust emerges from these experiences, right? These are experiences, not documents. Uh -huh. The documents will simply codify Memori the experience. They memorialize. But they're 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 not where the energy and the power lies. Did I mention the Curatic Alliance on our last call? I might have. So I, I had a friend who worked for the Curatic Alliance, which was founded by the guy who did Visa de Hoc, and it was a, he was all about chaotic organizations, chaos, somewhere between chaos and order. It was a really interesting thing. But the Curatic Alliance was their consultancy, and they had I thought a fatal flaw, which was the first thing they had any client do was sign a contract, a big agreement. <laughs> The first thing, and that was before they had worked together to build trust, before they had sort of figured out what this thing was and how it worked, and and they were getting stuck on that, you know, left, right, and center, and it made complete sense to me. So, so part of the reason I, I say I want, I would love for this to be really contagious, is that it should be easily contagious without being, nope, I'm not going to do anything with you until we've read all these pages and agreed to all these things. That that needs to not be the path. But it, needs, but it needs to be something that people start getting so so familiar with that they're like, I would be happy to work with you on this. Hey, let's use this this agreement bundle, this this protocol bundle. One one of the one of the bigger shifts that is is really it's central to the transformative aspirations of this is shifting people into present moment and into the emergent need. What is needed now? And out of the old paradigm, let me bring everything in the rearview mirror into, and let me project into futures that don't exist and try to do something. And a, and a really key part to changing the way human beings relate to co-creating together is getting them out of that pattern. And that that pattern of the pat be, you know, loading the present moment with the past and the projections into a future that doesn't exist has a reason for its existence because if you can keep people out of the present moment which is where their ultimate power and agency has an opportunity to manifest it's in the present moment where you actually create stuff you make agreements and do things and if you keep people preoccupied with the past or projecting into a future that doesn't exist you keep them disempowered so I think I sort of understand, but I'm not sure I do, because a piece of what agreements do and the law does is it synthesizes the past in a useful way. So, so it's very much about, hey, this is how we've been doing this for all along. That, that's well, the past. Well, the law, I mean, the law in particular, and, and by the way, I, I'm somebody who did was doing integral law for 30 years without having the name until Kim Wright and I crossed paths. And she hmm. was like, she described her work and I was like, oh, is that what I've been, <laughs> that what I've been doing? Um, the law, people are confused about what it is. If you look up the definition, what the law is, is defined as, is what happens in the face of a breach of agreement there being a defined penalty. It's all about punishment in the face of a failure agreement. That is literally the definition. Like if you look up the dictionary definition of the law, it's all about the penalty. It's all about the consequence for failure. 
whole construct is based on that. This is based on how do people want to work together? What does each person individually need to be happy in doing that? What do the group collectively need to agree to, to proceed, to, to create together? And this, res our protocols as a resource isn't just the reference base, but a big part of my, what's living for me in it, that's really, you know, the next in the shoot down the road is what is the sequence of questions and answers in a wizard-like interface for people that don't know where they're going, what they want. They know what they want to do. And helping give people answers and contextualizations and locations of decision points and choices that get them to their promised land. Right. So that whole layer is another dimension of this to be, you know, to 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 be announced, right? We have we're starting in the beginning. We're starting with let's get the protocol foundation repository dimensions down. But that's you know closely on the heels of. And in the course of doing that, there's opportunity to truly shift and reorient people out of this. Well, we need this, 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 and this, because old paradigm, that's the way it's done. And that's the old style law, right? It's inconceivable to start a business unless you define all of these things that are ultimately driven by risk mitigation, liability exposure, that are all driven by the penalty orientation that is not required. One does not have to invite that to the party to co-create together. So as an example to Jerry's point about like this big agreement that you have to sign up front in order to engage us, um, let's, let's build a small protocol that is an engagement protocol that simply states high level what we agree on and how we're going to use experiments to figure out what our subsequent protocols are going to be once this initial protocol goes through its its fruition. And so doing that is what we do. And, and we haven't been writing those protocols. We've been just verbalizing Living those protocols, them. <laughs> right? Um, what we do is we say, okay, here's our where we stand. Here's what we'd like to go. Here's how we're doing it. Are you good with this, right? Our approach, essentially we call it our approach. And, and yeah, we're, we're game for that. And that leads to the next protocol and to the next protocol and to the next protocol. And because you mentioned liberating structures, which isn't really a pattern language, but sort of is kind mm -hmm. of like a neighbor. Are you structuring this in a similar way so that it's got a, a recurring pattern to the protocols? We, we talked about that actually. D Doug brought that up. Um, I don't know what that means yet to, 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 to even think of what the, that structure might be. In pattern languages, it usually starts with this sort of situation arises a lot. When this happens, we recommend this because this, by the way, this pattern is related to this one, this one, this one, and this one. What we've got right now is here's a bunch of human needs, uh, practical human needs, and each of those practical human needs is there to serve life. And so that's, fundamentally, that's what the foundational needs, inquiry. Like that's it. what's needed now to from... serve. Yeah. And so anything that are, comes from any of those needs, the question is, is it a need? Is it a, a need that sits within one of the fun, foundational needs? Right? Like I need to impact the world. I need to do things in the world. And if I need to do things in the world, one of those things we call work now, um, and that thing that we call work must be serving that need in some way, right? And if it doesn't serve that need, then it's serving some other need, 
or it's not serving a need and it's doing something for some nefarious reason. But we need to understand that. And so our focus on the human needs as the as the ultimate pattern um, is, is, I think, kind of going down that path, but I'm not sure that that answers that question. Other thoughts? This is great. I'm, I'm really glad we set this up. Uh, Jose, I'm glad you wrote your post on LinkedIn. It's getting some good attention. I think that we can come back in and start to, we'll be able later to post some follow-ups and say, well, here's what came out of it. That'd be great. I think we have an agenda for some of our calls looking forward, um, probably mixed in with um, Neobooks Pops or whatever, as we because we started that as well. Uh, but we could also co-create co a couple of nuggets or pieces that explain this mm -hmm. that, could, that we could then pop. So yep. that seems like a very reasonable thing to do. <clears throat> it would be very interesting. It would be timely, but only in the course of two months to do uh, our protocols around political engagement or the election. I don't know what that would look like or what that means, but that would be a very germane, timely thing to produce perhaps. I started a new book on specifically focused on the election. Um, haven't posted to it in a couple of weeks, but uh, um, at least it's it's holding. So it's on the, it's on the uh, Google side. You know? Sweet. Other thoughts? Oh, I'm, I'm glad. Thank you. I'm glad that we had this conversation. And I'm glad that it that we see so much commonality, um, and that it's it's kind of bringing these pieces together. I still would like to think a little bit about that meta piece that that yep. bridges both of these pieces. I think yep. that to me is is an important piece, um, and I'm, I'm glad that it it seems to resonate. Um, but I'd also like. I think we'd like. Uh, lots of questions of, you know, why isn't this better? Why isn't that better? Um, mm -hmm. Only because we know a lot of them, but sometimes need to be reminded that we need this and we need that. So um, if if you see things, uh, please let us know. Yeah. And, and I'm, this conversation made me really much more conscious that Neo Books or NOGM need some rules of the road. They, we need some some guidance for people for how this works and what what to do, which is um, um, which would be useful and interesting. Um, and I had a second thought, but I forgot. I just posted the link to War Games and Strategy. Cool. <laughs> mm. I think there's a real value in uh, bringing up into consciousness some of the things that are sitting sort of. Um, sort of assumed knowledge that's underneath and that's probably in the storytelling element there it's really important it's probably where i can help you a little bit um where what it what its interface is that actually helps people connect uh, connect with it but for us to be actually working with something and i think that gives us a real practical experience of it which means that we're able then to put some um sort of skin on the bone so to speak mm -hmm. and and um i must say this very clearly this doesn't belong to Doug and I. This belongs to the community. So anybody who participates in this is this is ours. Um, there's a reason why there's a little R in front of protocols. Um, that little R is you um, and uh, and each of us. So it's not a you. It's an R. Ha. Ah. <laughs> um, I, I remember it, it's a it's a play on the I. Yeah, yeah. I remember the other question I had, which was. And you've not found other efforts around the world to do this, or you've sort of found them and blended with them like the integrative law movement? We've, we've, this has emerged more from uh, the needs of the, the organizations and the lawyers and the uh, people like Ambi that, that are like, we need to get this stuff out there and we need a way to do it in a better way. Um, and to bring this stuff together, to glue all of these different pieces together, then from the the handful of groups that have said, oh, we want to build new contracts, new agreements that are open, uh, because what we found is that they were working less from the need piece and more from a technical effort to take contracts, traditional contracts, and turn them into uh, open stuff. And so we're coming more from the collaborative spirit right. than the technolo technological spirit. 
Um, You're on mute. Uh, I'm but... sorry. You can't. You can't really sort of transcend and replace the old legal paradigms and prescriptions by trying to incrementally adapt from them. Then like back. It, yeah. If if you if you're starting with existing organizational structures, legal structures, and orientations and approaches at all, then you're contaminated by them and there's no actual transformative break with the old way of, of doing it. So it's this is really about growing new a new uh out of wholesale cloth um, from a defining protocols of people um, reflecting and manifesting the actual agreements between these are memorializations of but are not a surrogacy replacement for legal it, stuff it's really a whole new way of orienting and it sounds like that's another important thing to include on the site, which is how is this different from just mm -hmm, modifying mm -hmm, legal mm -hmm. contracts? Yeah, can't we different. can't we can't we backtrack? I think there needs to be a, a nice piece that says, "Hey, <clears throat> here's how they're different, and here's why this is the new way of thinking." Um, Jerry, do you, do you? Because there's a bunch of these things that uh, that we've mentioned. I haven't been writing them down. Do you have? Um, will you be able to share the transcript? Uh, I always do. So uh, if you go to the Mattermost. Uh, channel for the Neobooks calls. All of our calls are the recording. I see the video, but I didn't realize the transcript I, I, was there I, as well. I always post the video, a link to my brain notes for that call. And then afterward, I say, and also okay. the transcript, the chat, and the uh, AI summary. Perfect. So all, all of those are there for all of our calls. And I will do the same today Perfect. for this Thank one. You. Yeah, for sure. Got it, Ron. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe it's a good Jack moment Lester. to wrap the call. Um, my brain is full. This has been super, <laughs> really helpful. Um, I really appreciate it. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Cool. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Ciao. See you. Oh, hey.